What is it crack guys? It's Nathan here, aka The Rambling Kern, and the head instructor of Kern School of Combat. So, what I wanted to talk about today is Irish clothing, the traditional Irish clothing, and more importantly, what is it? So, for a lot of people, they would associate very specific things with traditional Irish clothing, and probably in most recent years, the Peaky Blinders look has kind of become the uh, modern hipster style of what people assume is traditional Irish clothing and it's not. Um, one of the reasons why I chose to focus on the current and what the current is and specifically how they dress and the equipment that they use is because that is very much the last point in history where you have a truly unique and distinct set of Irish clothing and set of Irish culture. Um, and in this video I'm going to dive into what exactly that is and why that is and also the origins of some of the modern um, items of clothing and how we view them as traditionally Irish. The thing to kind of keep in mind with much of what we view as traditional Irish clothing is not the history behind it as so much as the kind of cultural implications that it has. So um, this is not making fun of anyone who you know, uh, wears peaked caps or dresses in that Peaky Blinder style. For a lot of people that is their way to kind of reclaim their Irish culture and obviously there is a hugely widespread Irish diaspora around the world and I really respect people who have done that. It's more just to educate you in what exactly Irish, traditional Irish clothing is and what is Irish clothing in general. Um, because there's so many misconceptions to what that is and there's so many popular things in media and films and TV and everything else that get it very, very wrong. So, once again, one of the, one of the reasons why I focus in on specifically the 16th century is because that's when many of the Irish customs and traditions started to become outlawed. And that's really when the harshest of the penal laws started to come into place. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, during the various English conquests of Ireland, there were a succession of laws that were brought in to basically try to stamp out Irish culture in order to create a society that was more reliant and more based upon uh, England, basically to avoid future revolutions and wars essentially. Um, now this leads to a lot of very interesting things and a lot of very interesting uh, cultural crossover especially with um, you know Scotland and Ireland as I kind of mentioned in the previous video but more importantly there's a, a huge amount of um, kind of cultural enforcement and cultural oppression put on Ireland of certain things that were enforced here um, which I will go into some of the rules and some of the laws that were brought into um, so this is more to give you an, an education of where these things stand and it's not a critique on anyone who wears these items of clothing, like I mentioned. Um, a good example that someone pointed out to me in a kind of a recent discussion that we had on the, about this on Facebook was even the example of the kilt within Scotland is a enforced version of what the kilt was because it was outlawed at the time um, in Scotland itself. So a lot of parallels exist between Scotland and Ireland in that regard um, when it comes to traditional clothing and that's kind of something I wanted to touch on. And it is one of the main reasons why I want to showcase what the current was and what they did because to me, while they might be very odd looking garments in a modern sense, a lot of the traditions from that time and even prior to that time still continue to this day. And I find the clothing fascinating. It's such incredible looking and vibrant and unique sets of clothing that really weren't anywhere else in Europe at the time, before or since. There are certain items of clothing that mirror them, but there's very few items of clothing that uh, kind of even slightly parallel uh, towards them. So that's something I'm going to showcase too. Um, so I'm going to dive into the ins and outs of what Irish clothing is and what it isn't, and what are traditional and what are modern, or what are actually a foreign import or a foreign enforcement upon Ireland. So I do hope you enjoy and here we go. Well I think this picture is as good as I need to start on as it's uh, on the thumbnail it probably clickbaited you into uh, click on this video. So 
the Peaky Blinders look and why do I um, have such an aversion to this? So as somebody who teaches Irish martial arts, this look has almost become a uniform for Irish martial arts. Um, now, like I said, I do appreciate people trying to reclaim their culture and understand Irish culture a bit, but it's kind of important to note that this is not traditional Irish clothing. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, that are very important and I think worth understanding and also go back a very, very long time. So the items of clothing that you're seeing here, the bonnet or the flat cap, the Irish flat cap, so to speak, it's not Irish. It's a British invention. And more interestingly, it was one that became enforced in Ireland. So the flat cap comes from the bonnet and I'm going to show you a picture of and one by uh, Sally Pointer here, who's a fantastic um, costume maker and makes a incredible range of hats. She's actually made me one for this current project, which I'll showcase in some of the uh, future videos. So what you can see here is something that looks almost like a overly wide uh, flat cap. Now, these were very popular in Northern England at the time, and one of the things that happened with these, these kind of originated in 14th century Northern England, usually called a, a bonnet. And as you can see here from this other version, this is a Scott bonnet, or as the uh, pepper it later became known, the Scotch bonnet, due to that very distinctive shape. And basically, the reason I'm bringing this hat up especially is because in 1571, there was a decree from the British Crown that said that any man age six years old and over except for the nobility had to wear wool caps on sunday or be fined three farthings a day so this was later repealed in 1597 but by then the flat cap had basically become very strongly associated with a working class man because obviously nobility didn't have to wear it but more importantly anyone who was a working class person was kind of enforced to wear it now obviously over the coming centuries there was all sorts of variations of this and certain styles that became very popular all throughout the British Isles and obviously internationally as well but I think it's a very interesting thing to understand that the origin of these hats comes from colonial oppression of Ireland and an enforced rule it's not a domestic and popular um, fashion within the Isles I think it's a very interesting thing to note one of the hats that was popular and was domestically worn quite extensively here was what is often called the um, button bonnet, as you'll see here now in a second. So this version here is also made by uh, the very talented Sally Pointer, and I'm going to make sure to put her details down in the description should you wish to order any of her um, hats. So um, what I've also added in here is a picture of what is called the Kilcommon hat. Um, this find is actually incredible. So it was a full uh, set of clothing pulled out of a uh, bog in Ireland. One of the uh, lucky things of our uh, very wet climate is that we do have bogs and they do preserve cloth perfectly. So we have this fully intact hat, um, which seems to have been quite a popular style, as you can actually see from this picture here. And uh, I've highlighted the uh, gentleman in the middle wearing it. Um, so as you can see, these hats were very popular in Ireland, but also one of the reasons why I wanted to bring up these hats especially is because it really goes to kind of show some of the colonial oppression that was brought into Ireland and why these hats were enforced. So as part of what was going on at the time, Irish woolen textiles were beginning to become very highly prized um, all across Europe. Even the uh, Pope at the in the late 1400s actually ordered a number of woolen cloaks from Ireland. So one of the things that happened between the years of 1557 and 1560, um, 265, beg your pardon, 26,550 yards of Irish frieze used for capes was imported from Ireland into England. But by 1673, that industry and the trade was almost completely crushed due to the uh, British ban on Irish woolen products being um, imported. So by 1779, the woolen industry that was five centuries old at that point was completely destroyed um, and not near as profitable as it had ever been. So it's interesting to kind of understand the background of these garments, 
while they are very nice and do have a, a, a modern importance to them, the history to them is an important one, I think, to understand. So what was traditional Irish clothing? That's where these two next pictures are going to uh, kind of highlight really what they were. So by the tail end of the 16th century, Irish clothes were pretty much outlawed. And I'm going to dive into that in, in a few moments. But these were truly the last uniquely Irish sets of clothing that were developed entirely here and were such an incredible and vibrant set of fashion for the island. As you can see here, really vibrant colours, uh, women wearing these um, very elegant dresses, men with these large uh, flowy lena or shirts uh, with these very highly decorated and embroidered uh, ironer or jackets. Now over the next few weeks I'm going to dive into each and every individual um, item here, but I just think it's really beautiful to see these garments and how highly decorated they were. Now, obviously by modern standards we might consider these kind of colour contrasts a little bit gaudy, but I just think it's absolutely fascinating and it's quite sad to see these no longer represented or even really understood um, as they are a very fascinating and unique set of Irish uh, fashion that by the tail end of the 16th century were outlawed um, and punishable for anyone in the country wearing. So the first person to really stringently forbid Irish culture and Irish clothing was the man of many wives himself, Henry VIII. So in 1539, and I quote, it was forbidden that any person in Ireland to dress their hair in the Irish fashion or to weave any shirt, smock, kerchief, bandle, which is a band or ribbon, neckerchief, mocket, or linen cap, coloured or dyed with saffron, ni yet to use or wear in any of their shirts or smocks above seven yards or cloth to be measured according to the king's standards, and that also no woman use or wear any kirtle or coat tucked up or embroidered or garnished with silk or kerched overlaid and embroidered knee laid with usker jewel or ornament after the irish fashion and that no person or persons of what estate condition or degree they may be shall use or wear any mantles coat or hood made in the irish fashion now this basically forbids almost all of the traditional forms of Irish clothing. So the Lena is directly forbidden here. Basically the saffron coloured shirt that you would have seen in those previous two drawings is now forbidden. Both its colour and its actual shape. You cannot even use cloth to the required size in order to create and make a Lena. And also interestingly women are forbidden from ornamenting their clothes in what is the Irish fashion. Unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of artwork of this, which is a very much a shame. But as you can see here, even things like the traditional Irish brat or cloak is forbidden. Um, and this was really the beginning of the end for what was truly traditional Irish clothing. So one of the next men to really bring about a great change in Irish fashion was Sir John Perrett, or the Lord President of Munster. Uh, he also led much of the... Um, quashing of the rebellions in Munster and also the Munster plantations and I quote the inhabitants of cities and corporate towns shall wear no mantles Irish coats or great shirts nor suffer their hair to grow glib but to wear clerks gowns jackets jerkins and some civil garments and no maid or single woman shall wear or put any great roll or kerchief of linen cloth upon her heads neither any great smock with great sleeves but put on hats, French hoods, tippets, or some other civil attire upon their heads. So as you can see, this even goes so far as to forbid Irish hairstyles at the time, um, as well as various types of clothing, but also instructs on the type of clothing that has to be worn. And this is where early Irish fashion essentially becomes enforced, and where we start to see a particular style of Irish fashion come about. But this did not mean the end of these forms of Irish fashion, merely a alteration and a very clear suppression of them. So the interesting thing with Ireland is after the 1500s and into the 1600s, clothes very much just becomes a reflection of what was popular in England at the time. But by the 1700s and 1800s, then we start to see a very unique set of Irish fashion start to creep through. 
And as you can see from this gentleman here, there's a few distinctive things. The combination of waistcoat and top hat of a very distinct style. And this is something that becomes very uniquely Irish over the next hundred or more years. So next up you see a bunch of turf cutters, the uh, classic Irish uh, pastime for anyone who's lived in the uh, country. Um, and as you can see here, again, the kind of waistcoat, the cap, kind of a distinctive sort of fashion that starts to emerge. Now both of these last two pictures are from the 1900s, so as you can see it's a very uh, kind of set sort of uh, Irish fashion that starts to creep in. So. I find these two pictures very, very interesting. That's why I chose these two specifically. So the gentleman on the left is a possible faction fighter from the mid 1800s. And the gentleman on the right is just a, a general um, countryman from the uh, 1900s, very early 1900s. And as you can see, this is what a faction fighter would look like. And if you're trying to recreate uh, the imagery of a faction fight, this is what it would look like. So it would be this very distinctive style of top hat, waistcoat, breeches, shirt, and usually a uh, long jacket. And there's a lot of reasons as to why we don't see this. And one of the main reasons is, again, due to colonialism and a very negative image put upon these. Probably the most distinctive and most well-known would be the leprechaun. Now, this is something obviously that the Irish have somewhat reclaimed, but there is a reason why this look is not popular and there's a reason why this part of history is kind of ignored. So one of the main reasons and one of the kind of classic tools of any colonial power is to kind of cast derision upon those who they're conquering and also to make them look like animals and less than. Um, and that was something that was very commonly done in the British papers during the late 1800s, well, mid to the late 1800s, especially when Ireland was looking for independence. So as you can see from these series of punch cartoons, you see the Irish portrayed as apes. You see them portrayed in this very distinctive style of Irish fashion, but shown as absolute barbarians. And that is something, like I say, that was very commonly done um, with colonial powers over the those that they've um, conquered. but. As a result, this image and this negative stereotype has remained in Ireland and these looks as distinctive as they were are still kind of viewed with this air, especially within Ireland where it's viewed as this very backwards and almost comical version of Ireland that doesn't exist any longer, which is quite a shame. So I guess to kind of conclude on this, one question a lot of people will be asking is, was there anywhere where traditional Irish clothing and culture did remain and yes there definitely was a good place to look at is obviously the west of the country which it was a little bit more sparsely populated but also a little bit more uh, rural and as a result a lot of these traditions kind of kept going so a good example is the Chris belt um, which I will do a video on that remained in the Aran Islands and this amazing uh, recolorized photo really goes to show that um, another really interesting aspect as well is the um, Clada area within Galway which maintained its amazing culture and it's this lady here this outfit is just breathtaking and it is something that really doesn't get near enough focus in my opinion in, in modern history the ladies fashion of Ireland over the centuries has been incredible and I really do wish there was more work done in this area and um, as you can see this piece is just breathtaking um, another interesting note within the Aran Islands as well is that the Aran sweater is an English import so again another thing that we view as Irish but it isn't uh, the same goes for Donegal Tweed as well well guys I hope you enjoyed that video um, what I'm going to do over the next few weeks is I'm going to go into detail of each of the items of um, what a current war and what the traditional clothing within Ireland was at the time. Obviously you've touched on it a bit in this video, but I wanna go into the, the kind of ins and outs of why those items were popular, the kind of history of them, um, and kind of show you them in reality and how they, they fit and how they wear and what they like to move around in. And that's a big part of why I'm undertaking this project and why I wanna showcase this stuff, because this is a hugely interesting part of Irish history that's just gone very much ignored for the past 
well, for the past. Um, so it is something I really want to dive into and, and kind of showcase to everyone. If you have any questions about this, please feel free to uh, comment down below and obviously like and subscribe and all that stuff. It does really help. I do really appreciate everyone, everyone for doing it. And um, if there's any sort of videos you'd like to see or if there's any specific uh, videos on Irish clothing or anything like that you'd like to see as well, please let me know. I'm more than happy to do it. Um, as I say, the next coming weeks we're going to dive into each of the individual items of the clothing that the current were associated with. Um, as well as showing you the items themselves, showing you what they're like to wear and obviously then in the next coming months once the weather warms up a little bit I'll actually show you what it's like to be outdoors in them and to actually uh, live and be outdoors in them so I really do hope you enjoyed and uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, have a great week guys, it's long.